Hello everyone and welcome to Superman Homepage. My name is Steve Eunice from supermanhomepage.com and I am sitting uh, at the moment in an interview process with uh, Ed Gross and Bob Greenberger, the authors of Superman The Definitive History, a gargantuan book that is imminently uh, about to be released um, and I am a so pleased to have both of you gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Now, uh, Ed, you and I go well back. Uh, we've uh, known each other for quite a few years. I've had you on as a guest on uh, our live show on Superman Homepage Live. Uh, we've met in person in Metropolis, Illinois, for the Superman celebration. Uh, but, Bob, this is the first time you and I have have chatted. Uh, just, do you want to quickly, I'll start with you, Bob, uh, give us just a you know, quick introduction, who you are, what you do, let the fans know who, you know, why it is where we're having a chat tonight. Well, in addition to uh, having done this book with Ed, uh, I have been a comic book reader since I was six years old. My first comic was the Superman book. Wanted to go into publishing, very inspired by Clark Kent, the George Reeves uh, version, and wound up at DC Comics where I worked there for 20 years, did a year at Marvel, went back to DC for four more years. And along the way have edited things with Superman in it. I've written a couple of Superman stories for the comics, um, co-wrote the Essential Superman Encyclopedia with Marty Pasco, and here we are. Very good. That's very concise. Ed. <laughs> yes. Yourself, give a bit of a background about uh, who you are and uh, you know your uh, affiliation with Superman. Affiliation goes back a long way. Uh, I'm an entertainment journalist by trade and been doing it for about 40 years. Uh, written a number of books, uh, the most recent being, of course, the one with Bob right now, uh, Superman the Definitive History. Uh, my discovery process of Superman was uh, when I was a kid and uh, watched reruns of George Reeves' show in the 60s and then uh, discovered... My father had a comic book about dogs, and I realized that I'd never seen a comic book before, but when they said at the end of Superman, you know, based on the magazines or comics appearing in DC Comics, I suddenly said, wow, they're writing comics based on this TV show. That's awesome. Uh, but the combination of the show and the comic book made me fall in love with Superman, and then I went out and started collecting Superman as a little kid, uh, anything with the S on it, and that never went away, basically, uh, my entire life. Fantastic. Well, we're here to chat about your new collaboration, Superman, The Definitive History, uh, which is a enormous book. It, um, we are just chatting before we started recording, Bob and I, about just how heavy this um, <laughs> publication is. Um, first and foremost, what inspired you to create Superman, The Definitive History? Was there a particular moment or story that sparked the idea? Well, I mean... It really started, I think, and correct me if, you, if, if I'm wrong, Bob, but I think it was Inside Editions, basically, were planning on doing a Superman book. And they came to me because I had the other book I had written called Voices from Krypton, an oral history of Superman. And because of that, they approached me about doing this one. And so it was really, it started with Insight, but then, of course, Bob brought his knowledge and skills, and I brought mine, and that, plus the incredible amount of art they have, really is how it all came together. They had like access to like these incredible archives. I don't know, Bob has more to add on that, but. I mean, yeah, I mean, Inside had done a large similar, but not as uh, elaborate Batman book a few years ago. Uh, so Superman seemed the next logical candidate in their mind, I presume. You know, I never really talked to them about how it came about and why now before the, you know, well before the movie, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, they've got a reputation that apparently opens doors to people's collections. Uh, so they were able to find all sorts of real interesting artifacts. And people reached out to us via Facebook when they heard about it and said, hey, I've got something that might be useful for the book. And, and sure enough, a couple of those pieces uh, found their way in. Very cool. Well, um, yeah, the timing is interesting because here we are a couple of months out from the release of a new Superman movie in July 2025. And this is called The Definitive History. And how do you approach a book that is called The Definitive History when the character and new information continues to come out? Was there like a, an issue there about how do we 
you know, encapsulate this when there's new information always coming and where do we stop? Well, we, I think we stopped where the deadline let us stop. I mean, seriously, <laughs> we're up to this point where like, for instance, Superman War World, I think had just kind of concluded and it was moving on from there. But I think in terms of the comics, it largely closes with that whole set, the aftermath of War World, if I remember mm. correctly. Uh, yeah, right, so pretty much the end of the Philip Kennedy Johnson run. Um, yeah. Because of the long lead time, a book like this requires to manufacture and design. Um, Ed and I had to be done with our writing by the end of 2023. Yeah. So that's so you know we didn't even know what the fourth and final season of uh, Superman and Lois was going to be like, or anything about the new feature film. That must have we, been hard. We crammed in. I mean, for instance, I got interviews with the showrunners of uh, my adventures with Superman. So we were able to talk about season two, even though season two hadn't premiered yet. Mm. But because it was official, they were able to talk to us about it rather than uh, make a, you know, do that usual cryptic thing of, well, I can't really say too much and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. In this case, they could say. And uh, but yeah, but now, of course, this I think is a kind of book that can be updated periodically as the adventures continue. Well, can I mean, imagine what that process would be, be like. Help us. You know, there's still <laughs> going to be Superman in the media, even though the yeah. CW series is coming to an end. Hmm. Uh, Superman followed a year later by the Supergirl movie and the characters appearing in other uh, James Gunn run stuff. So yeah, future editions make logical sense, but at some point, you know, you can't keep waiting for something to end. You got to celebrate Superman now. Yes. And then yeah. again, Yep, for sure. Now, the book covers Superman across different media, and we've, as we've spoken about. Uh, how did you approach gathering such a vast amount of material across comic books, TV, film, and on and on? I mean, Ed, you want to pick this throughout up? Most of, yeah, yeah. Throughout, throughout most of my time as a journalist, anytime there's been a new Superman, I've covered it. So I made contacts with a lot of people over the years, um, so I'd done the base work in with Voices from Krypton, but then we had to elaborate beyond that because obviously we're not just going to repeat stuff that was there. Hmm. But it created a ground a ground floor for it, I think, in terms of the interviews, and we built on that. We spoke to many, many people on top of that. So once they broke everything down into the different sections, whether it's comics or movies, TV, everything had its own section, basically, its own chapter uh we were able to add to it and build on it basically for based on what was there and all the like i say the new the additional interviews we did you know ed and i having grown up and having absorbed all of this material both of us possess a vast working knowledge so i, I suspect the two of us could have done rough drafts of our chapters without opening a reference book and then go back in and, and you know fill in some of the blanks and then conduct the interviews. Uh, you know, I, I think Mark Wade is the only one who, you know, who knows more than we do. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, but when Bob, when, when Bob wrote the, he, I mean, Bob really wrote the comic book chapter. It was one of the chapters he wrote, but that was his big chapter, I mm. think. And I looked yes. at that in awe because when they said to me, they go, well, we're going to cover the four main titles in, super depth and cover it through from the beginning to where it is now. And I was kind of like, yeah, I don't think I can do that. But then I read Bob's stuff. I was like, yep, he did it much better than I could have done it. All I could do is add some interviews to him and stuff. So it worked out really well. Well, can we talk about that collaborative process? Like what is it like <laughs> and how do you collaborate on a, on a project like this? How do you divide the research, the re writing responsibilities? Uh, is that just an organic thing or is there a plan in place? You know, does that have to be mapped out and decided who's going to do what? I'll, I'll be honest, you know, Ed did the lion's share of the work because this was supposed to be his book. But at some point um, when Tim Pilcher became the editor of the book for Insight, uh, I gather something said Ed needed help. The schedule demanded, you know, did. <laughs> Ed so said something he needed help. Tim and I go back to our DC days together. So, um, you know, Tim originally started saying, can you do these 12 sidebars? I said, sure. Then he comes back and he goes, can you do the comic book chapter? And I go, sure. 
Uh, so really, you know, Ed had figured out chapter by chapter what was going to go in each one. So I just did my parts of it. And then as Ed is reading them, he said, oh, I've got some quotes here from the um, from the other book. I'll, I, I can weave them in. So he was able to add his stuff. And then uh, I guess in the captioning phase, I was able to add a couple of additional tidbits here and there. So that's where the collaboration happened, you know, kind of organic and on the fly. Yeah, absolutely. And and very nicely when it, like, especially like including the comic book history, we could go back to people like Mark Wade. I could say, oh, I need, I need information on this or Philip Kennedy Johnson and said, look, we're, you know, I need something on this villain or this thing you were doing or whatever it is. So it was a constant going back to people and driving them crazy, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, we did a chapter on the music, the sounds of Superman, and uh, I just wrote Al Goff and Miles Miller and said, I need to know why somebody saved me. It became the song quickly. <laughs> I need a quote. Why did you pick that one? And they gave me a quote and uh, and there you go. So anyways, it's a constant evolving thing is what I'm trying to say. It's like every time something would come up, you'd reach out to somebody and say, do you have information on this we could use? that kind of thing. Uh, I can only imagine how much today's technology played a role in having that access, ac you know, access to certain people and being able to get that instant response and, you know, try to write this, you know, 20 years ago and you would have it took, would have taken forever and probably not even wouldn't have been possible. But um, what were some of the biggest challenges in researching for this book? You know, were there any sources that were particularly hard to track down or people that were, you know, um, not available or you couldn't find who, you know, how to actually contact them. I'll start with you, Ed. I mean, I, I gotta be honest. I mean, obviously people who are gone can't help us, uh, <laughs> you know, Siegel and Schuster that, but we have permission to reprint some quotes from them. So they were able to get in the book that way. Uh, no, I found that actually, and it was the same thing on voices from Krypton in that these people are so into the subject and we're so, just reverential about Superman that you found that most people made the time they, they wanted to be participate in this. So there really wasn't, I can't think of anybody that really said, Oh no, I, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. You know, mm -hmm. they were all so enthusiastic about it. And to me, that's a wonderful experience. It's not, I've done other, many other books and believe me, it's not always that easy uh, with people, you know, trying to get them to talk or they'll give you 15 minutes or something. And these people, like, they basically made all the time we needed. I mean, whatever was necessary, they did. And that's very rare. The challenge for me on some of the sidebars were about some of the more obscure things, like the various Superman fan clubs. And I didn't realize initially that there were splinter versions of the Superman for America fan club. Uh, you know, so there were variations of it. And... Um, you know, the Superman homepage certainly pointed me in some directions, but, uh, some of the rest, you know, required a bunch of, um, online digging to find anyone or anything that, uh, you know, covered these variations so I could delineate for the readers. There was this one related to the bread and this one for Superman, Tim and so on. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so let's look at some of the iconic moments in Superman's history in your opinions. I'll start with you, Bob. What are the top three most iconic moments in Superman history for you? And why did you choose to highlight them in the book in particular? I guess one of the, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is the first time Superman catches Lois, which is either action one or two. I don't remember where, where the story sp uh, splits there, but it's that, you know, that set the tone. Superman leaps up into the air to catch this woman who is astonished, you know, he, he can do that. Um, and that showed the kids, you know, it's one thing to lift the car, car over his head. It's another thing to be up in the air where most of us would like to spend some time. Uh, so that's number one. Wow. Um, that's a tough question. You know, I, yeah. You know, as a kid, the bullets bursting off George Reeves's chest episode after episode just showed you, you know, how remarkable it was and how stupid the criminals were because they kept firing when it was clearly not working. <laughs> then there was that one one who threw one guy who threw the gun at him after firing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, 
and, and I'm thinking, you know, one of the other ones has to be some image. And I'm thinking of Superman for All Seasons by Jeff Loeb and Tim Sales. Just, just some of that iconic imagery mm. of Clark on the farm with uh, Jonathan and Martha, because that gives him his moral underpinnings. Mm-hmm. Nice. Ed, you want to weigh in All on right, that? Top that, Ed. Yeah, I don't think I can. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, the things that stick out in my mind are like, and comic book wise, it's things like, for some reason, I have always latched on to the Kryptonite Nevermore storyline. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. I just found it to be such a human Superman in that story. And it stuck with me since I was 11 years old. I have a comic rack in this room and that whole arc is is on that comic rack because wow. I've always, something about that story has always appealed to me. A guy recognizing he has too much power and is okay with giving some of it up because no one should be that powerful, which I thought was really good. Uh, Mark Wade's birthright is a more recent, but it stays mm-hmm. with in a major way as far as his origin mm-hmm. and capturing what you're talking about, Bob, with the the moral underpinnings of, of Clark and, and who he is. But then, but then there, are, I mean, uh, Superman two. My favorite moment of all the Superman movies is shocking to me because it's such a simple moment is when Lois is in the uh, elevator in Paris and it's falling and Superman swoops in, catches it, looks up at her. She goes like, oh, my God, you know, thank God it's you or something. And he just gives Christopher Reeve gives this incredible smile. And all he says is, I believe this is your floor, Miss Lane. (laughs) And it nails Superman for me for some reason. That's one of the things that really nails the character for me, you know, and of course, the helicopter reference uh, rescue in Superman the movie was as yes. an 18-year-old sitting there watching uh, the John Williams theme blaring. I think it changed me forever <laughs> watching that. It was just incredible. See, so. you, stro- you said that was a tough question, and you end up coming with four answers. So, um, <laughs> You want some more? Yeah. I got No, I no, we, we can go through the book. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned earlier about when you were interviewing people and people were just so ready to talk about Superman because they have such a reverential you know, um, feeling for him and a, as a character. So how, why do you think that is? What, what has, what's, has Superman's role been as a cultural icon and how has it evolved, especially in terms of his global influence? Well, I mean, look, mm. in, you know, in more recent years, they've come up with the whole, you know, he stands for hope. Mm-hmm. He stands for he is the bright light in the middle of darkness, basically. And I think most of the people I've spoken to, because there's a whole I, I had in the past written whole sections talking about the dy- dynamic of Superman, you know, what he brings and what he represents and that sort of thing. And people have all basically said the same thing that, yeah, sometimes he's considered corny and out of touch with the times and that sort of thing. But when you stri- you can strip that away very easily and latch on to he's the best of us. He is inspirational. He is, uh, Jeff Loeb said it, uh, no, actually, I'm sorry. It's, uh, Mark Wade said to me that uh, Superman has the power to do anything he wants in the world. He has the power to take over if he wants, but he chooses to do what's right. And I think that's really powerful. And it really is what everyone ha- I've spoken to has sort of latched onto. And that's what separates him from all the other heroes is that, yeah, they may give hope to people and they're rescuing them and all that stuff, but he symbolizes hope Hmm. more than any of them. And it's, and I just find that very inspirational. I think they do too. And that's sort of the gist of what many of them said to me. I don't think I can top that. (laughs) (laughs) Very well said. Yeah. I've, uh, for me, it's always been, you know, he does the right thing simply because it's the right thing to do. Uh, yeah. He doesn't have an ulterior motive. He's not out for revenge or vengeance or, you know, it's just because he was brought up the right way to, you got to help people. And I think that's what resonates with me and why he's lasted so long. Uh, which brings me to my next question is Superman has undergone so many significant changes since his creation in 1938. Which era or version of the character do you think resonates most with fans or resonates most with yourselves? Bob, I'll go with you first. I'm going to start by talking about the Kurt Swan drawings of Superman. Mm -hmm. Because Kurt started in the 50s and stopped in the 80s. So that's 30 years. That's a couple of generations of people who grew up on that iconography of who Superman is. And, you know, 
comic readers weren't exposed to a lot of uh, the Joe Schuster or Schuster Studio art until much later, the 70s, then the 80s with the, you know, the birth of the archive series. Um, and, you know, you either grew up on, on the goofy plot first concepts of, of the Mort Reisinger era, uh, you know, with three stories per issue and they were all interesting gimmicks. Or, um, or the Julie Schwartz era that began with Superman Nevermore, Superman 233, uh, where they were more character-based, more human-based as the next generation of writers like Carrie Bates, Elliot Magan, and Marty Pasco stepped in. Um, I, I think that's the, the generation that has been so formative. I, I agree. I mean, uh, you know, what's funny is like you go back to the Silver Age stories and they're really silly to a large degree. I mean, I have to say they really are. I tried reading some of them. It's like, wow, it's rough. But what stuck with me then as a kid reading those things, which when I thought they were brilliant and they, they are in their own way, they introduced so much to the mythology of Superman. Like even if it was corny uh, or whatever, like, oh, there's this comet, the super horse, you know, and Streaky, the super cat and all that stuff. And that's all silly, but it still enlarged the mythology that was then allowed to sort of evolve and grow and become more, more mature. And I think that's the brilliance of the, the mythology of the Silver Age of Superman that was created is it planted the seeds. Hmm. And in the decades since, it's just evolved into this incredible world that, that you know, Superman's. What was that? Every time there's been a reboot, going back to even John Byrne in 1986, this stuff that Weisinger introduced in the 50s and early 60s is among the first pieces of the reboot that get brought back in their own modern incarnation. Hmm. They're not bringing back the Daily Star or George Taylor, you know, from, from the original runs. Um, they're barely doing the ultra human humanite, but they're doing their version of Streaky, their version of the Bottle City of Candor and, and so on. Hmm. Very interesting. So Obviously, the book starts chronologically, you know, going from the 1930s with Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster and their personal stories. And that's always been fascinating for me about those two young men, you know, who created Superman and the evolution of their relationship with DC Comics over the years and and how, you know, now their names are synonymous with, you know, as Superman's creators because of, you know, the landmark decisions that have been made and the people who have gone into bat for them and made sure that their legacy is adequately honored. It's a real massive chapter of earlier in the, in the book. And it's, it's always been in a very interesting part of the Superman story for me. And I'm always surprised that we haven't actually had a live action dramatization of that whole creation of Superman. That, you know, it hasn't been done. I believe Ilya Salkine was playing with the idea before. And there've been books written about, the uh you know jerry siegel and joe schuster's story what do you think is it a, is that a a tragic story or is it a um heroic story how, how do you look back at those two guys and their story and what do you think that modern audiences or modern fans should take away from you know, is it a cautionary tale what, how do you look back at siegel and schuster's story ed i i mean look there are two sides to that story and i know there are people who get mad every time I say mm -hmm. something like that, but I have to tell you, I have spent, that was a rabbit hole that I went down and took me months to work my way through in trying to create a balanced, true uh, accounting of what went on there. It's true. They sold the rights to Superman for $130. That was also the way things were done back then. It's just the bottom line. The work for hire agreements. That's what it is now. At the same time, now let me let me preface this by saying: Should Warner slash DC had a moral obligation to do something better for them earlier? Yes, given the success of Superman, I think, and the millions they were making, yeah, something should have been done for its creators. But they were there for ten years, and if you update for inflation, they made the equivalent of about six million dollars in in uh, in that ten year period. They sued DC for rights that they no longer owned because they sold them and got fired as a result. Jerry Siegel went back to work for DC after Joanne Siegel kind of coerced them to bring him back 
And he was brought back not in the great terms. I mean, I'm not going to say they were heroes at uh, DC for bringing him back at that point. But the same thing happened when he realized he, was, he could sue again. He did. And he got fired again. And that led to the destitution that these guys were in, which they shouldn't have been in. That's the truth. So I, I don't look at them as victims, really, because it's kind of like they brought some of this on themselves, I think, by suing when when they were advised not to and they did it anyway. I mean, their lawyer said they should do it, but a lot of people didn't. And that's a rough line to walk because I know I sound like a creep saying that, but it's just there are, like I said, there are two sides. And the bottom line is, I felt great joy in 1978, for some reason, not, it didn't affect me, but when it said Superman created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster showed up in Superman the movie, even at 18, mm -hmm. I remember how thrilled I was to see that credit, and they deserve it, that's the thing, so it's so back and forth, because on the one hand, you're saying, well, there's two sides and all that stuff, and they kind of messed up in certain things they did, but they also deserve so much more because of what they gave the world and what that creation brought to DC, I think. You know, the publishing industry back then was down and dirty. The idea of intellectual property, the IP everyone is, you know, trying to develop today wasn't on anyone's mind. I mean, you know, you did a, a comic book and maybe you'd get a strip and maybe a serial, maybe a radio show, but the, marketing and sales bonanza that Superman generated fairly quickly was unprecedented. And I don't think Don and Feldon Leibowitz, who were running the company, did right by uh, the boys. I, I think, you know, they, when Jerry complained, you know, Leibowitz would cut a check and say, go away, leave me alone. You know, see, here's a bonus. Um, I think something more formal should have been done. And I, you know, have to say, you know, I think it's the inexperience on those guys because they'd never mm -hmm. had anything like this before. There was no precedent. They were said worked before. Um, I think Jerry got very bad advice. And uh, I think it was the lawyer was an army buddy of his who talked him into suing in 48. And I don't think the guy knew what he was doing, which I think hurt. Uh, you know, so the mistakes were made on both sides. Mm. Absolutely. Now, talking about controversial moments in Superman's history, uh, were there any others that you felt essential to include and how did you approach about writing them? Like, you know, 85 years of history, is, was there controversial moments that were, you know, discussed about including or not including in the book? I mean, I really found the biggest balancing act was the Siegel-Schuster thing. That was mm -hmm. sort of... I didn't run into any problems in them saying, oh, no, you can't do that. It was more about the early history of D.C. Right. And people who were involved, but they insisted weren't involved. Uh, and, you know, it it's awkward because um, there were certain people at the beginning of the thing where we got shut out in helping create everything. I don't really want to go into names per se, but I will say that in their own documentary, they mentioned the names. <laughs> I mean, it's in their own history of DC. That was really where I found the biggest problems were because I think there was some worry about, well, you can't say so-and-so was there because what does that mean to the ownership of this? Or what does this mean to the creation of this? And that's where I think we ran into, if there was any trouble at all, those early days when there's nobody alive from those days to supply the actual facts of what went down. Uh, that's That was sort of the most awkward thing. I think everything else, I didn't have any problems at all with the production elements of Superman, you know, the various mm -hmm. uh, uh, adaptations. And honestly, on, you know, the material I contributed to the book, you know, most of it was stuff that was written and drawn and published and uh, filmed and, you know, so, you know, there's a documented record of that. Um, you know, I had to dance around a little bit about why Byrne left the way he left. Um, that might have been the stickiest point in the comics chapter. Fair enough. Now, talking about the comic book side of things, the impact of Superman's death. I mean, you know, the death of Superman storyline had a massive cultural impact. Um, how did you choose to cover it and what did you feel was significant? in sharing that, you know, the way the public perceived 
this event? You know, it was one of those moments, and I was there in, on staff at the time, uh, mm. where we did not expect the mainstream press to notice it, because back then they didn't notice much of what was being published. But one of the small distributors shared it with his local media, and the story caught fire. And you know, DC, you know, covering that, you, you had to talk about the Herculean efforts DC did to capitalize on, on a runaway beast, hmm. uh, getting enough. You know, we basically ran out of DC cornered the market on black satin for the armbands when they kept doing more and more of the poly bag books. <laughs> Literally, I mean, we, we were told about this. And then the instant reprint, being able to you know put those issues together in a very fast, hard, uh, soft cover. Uh, the presses were running day and night. I mean, there's even some documentary footage of that um, that's out there. And, you know, you have to talk about the phenomenon, the fact that what was going to be a story that was a filler basically because the wedding had to be postponed in the comics because of the ABC show that all of a sudden it's this phenomenon. And then it's how do you carefully bring it back and how do you capitalize on it? So initially they hadn't figured out on, on the four replacement Superman that that happened as things started to organically evolve at these Superman summits. Uh, you had to talk about it as, as a phenomenon and how, Superman, going back to what we talked about earlier, meant so much to so many people in so many different ways that the idea that he dies shocked them. Hmm. You can't do that. That's Superman, you know? You also have the resonance of that story continuing to this day in the yeah. sense of, you know, there were, there were all those attempts in the 90s to adapt it into a movie, the Nicolas Cage one. Darn it. So sorry we missed that one. Not... Um, but you got the Superman Doomsday animated film. You got the Death of Superman, Reign of the Superman animated films. Then you have Superman and, and Lois, which has just done the Doomsday story, their own version of it, but they've done it. The story lives on and everyone is, seems to be fascinated in trying to come up with ways to bring it to life. I mean, Zack Snyder did a version of it in Man of Steel with, with that version of Doomsday. I mean, it just lives on all these years later and people are constantly dipping into that particular well. Yeah, it definitely continues to be something that resonates and the amount of reprints and omnibuses and things that they keep coming out with, they just keep, you know, people just keep putting their hands in their pockets to dish out some cash to get the different versions that are out there. But um, so we've talked about comics, we've talked about, you know, the movies, you know, Superman's been on radio, TV, animation, video games. Which medium do you guys think has best captured the essence of Superman, either in general or for you in particular? I'll go with you, Ed. Well, I think, I mean, for me, the standouts, it's 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 the movies, mm -hmm. it's it's Christopher Reeve, but it's, you know, it I follow, you know, the expression I use, and people are sick of hearing me say it, I'm sure, is I follow the yes. So it's like whoever's wearing the yes, I go with it. I mean, mm -hmm. I am excited to see whoever it is playing Superman, whether it's on television, animation, movies, whatever it may be, I just want to see that character. And it's because the character means so much to me. I live by that for you know, live. I mean, you know, but to me, it's like also like James Bond, right? I will follow James Bond, whoever's playing James Bond. Pee Wee Herman's playing James Bond. Okay, I'm on board. Uh, <laughs> but but that's so I can't really. I can point to a favorite Superman, but as far as which medium or anything has had the most impact on me. It's all of them. It's it's. I love more like when when Brian Singer did his documentary in two thousand six. Mm -hmm. I love more than anything hearing the John Williams theme play, and a montage of all the different versions of Superman playing over it, because to me that's it. It's one universe, so to speak, with this character who has lived on. I can't think of too many characters who, since in every decade since he was created has been in some form of production. Hmm. That's incredible. If you think about it, every decade has had their versions of Superman. And I don't get, I don't get it. I mean, I get it, but I'm shocked by it that it could have that longevity in these different versions. But that's really sort of how I view it is. Just follow the yes. Hmm. 
you, for me, you know, it started with the comics for me. It's always going to start with the comics. It's always going to be that because that's what imprinted on me. And it also, Superman changed a business and created, you know, gave me an opportunity to have a job, which I'm, mm. you know, delighted about. Uh, but beyond that, um, I have to say the movies took Superman from being a super friend because for the 70s, it was pretty much relegated to just animation, 60s and 70s, you know, and the movies gave him back to everybody. And I think that's important. Um, and, you know, I'm sure our new actor in the suit is going to be great when I see him next July. But again, imprinting. I mean, you know, Christopher Reeve just nailed it so perfectly. It's going to be very hard to top that. Well, that's so true. He's just been the definitive Superman for so many people talking about the word definitive. Um, and But as you said, Ed, every generation has had their version of Superman. So for many people... You know, it's Henry Cavill, and that's all they can see. That's the only Superman that they will accept. And then, you know, I always wonder if the internet had existed back in 1978 when the movie came out, and you know, there were the George Reeves fans. And they go, "That's not how the Fortress of Solitude. Well, that's not how you know they would have. You know, the way we pick apart movies today, and they, oh, there's no red trunks. How can we? You know, how can Superman have no red trunks? You know, and then, you know, there would have been you know fans at the time who would have been, I'm sure, you know just going, oh, that's not the way Superman, that's not my Superman. Right. You know, it's funny, um, James, Gun James Gunn was playing coy about whether or not the red trunks were going to be there. So when I was writing the sidebar about the different Superman costumes over the years, I finished the sidebar with this great quote from Gunn talking about whether or not the trunks, you know, were important or not. And then as the book is in production, he reveals the first picture and we see the trunks. So I had to call Tim and go, we have to fix that. Thankfully we were able to. Uh, I imagine. All right. So in the book, you discuss Superman's involvement in public service announcements. How important do you think Superman's role has been in promoting social justice and moral values? I mean, I think it goes back to what I said before about the hope. I think, I think mm. whether it's a public service announcement, he's somebody to inspire, whether he was uh, in the World War II or in more recent years. Uh, so I do think, I think worldwide, you know, the expression people use is like there are three most most recognizable symbols in the world are the, the cross, the Jewish star, and the Superman S. That's got to say something, that it can have that kind of impact around the world. It's almost like a religion. <laughs> it's only Praise Rao. So, <laughs> you know, um, those PSAs that were done by Jack Schiff uh, in the comics through the 1950s really helped, you know, that generation. And I think it was great. And then there was the George Reeves, you know, Stamp Day for Superman um, mm -hmm. short that was done. Uh, you know, I'm sorry that they didn't last longer, you know, carried into the 60s and 70s when I think kids needed it. Mm. Well, we had also like those, you know, cigarette commercials about, you know, don't smoke, um, right. you know, uh, and all those kinds of things. And then there's that iconic poster of, you know, so Superman talking about, you know, being un-American if you're seeing someone talking down to someone or, you know, uh, judging someone by the color of their skin or the clothes that they wear and all those kinds of things. And I think that's what, for so many people, Superman stands for is that, you know, his ability to break through the barriers of prejudice and, you know, all those kinds of things. The whole term of social justice warrior today, it's almost like it's a, a slur on someone if you're a social justice warrior, but Superman so much is that and has been for so many generations. I think one of the things that, I'm sorry, Bob, uh, this, this go ahead, go, go. no, I apologize. Uh, uh, one of the things that's always stood out for me was Superman and the Mole Men. Mm -hmm. when he stood up for the little mole people, but also in the town where the people are all armed with guns. And he, he says, you're carrying yourselves like you're Nazi stormtroopers or something. And it's just, 
powerful watching this guy being able to call them out on what they were doing and how they were behaving and and what they were representing really with that hate in them hmm. uh so anyway that's that's what all i was going to say on that i was just going to add on that you know one of the things we haven't talked about is one of the reasons superman resonated was not just the powers mm -hmm. but uh in 1938 you still had that melting pot going on with immigration in the united states and superman's the ultimate immigrant mm -hmm. he's the one who comes from nothing and is adopted by this new land and they raised him through those values and he's been giving back ever since you know he really is the embodiment of the american dream you know making something of yourself giving this opportunity well said now we've obviously your book is the definitive history of superman but looking to the future you see obviously superman's legacy is going to continue are there any current trends in the superhero media that you think might shape his next era uh bob i'll start with you wow uh you know right now dc is just starting a new wave of material there's the absolute superman and the all-in line of um, the titles that have new creators on them that's going to play out for the next couple of years and i think the success or failure of the superman feature next july will help determine that next phase for mm -hmm. for superman um is it going to spin off to to more movies or is he just going to be a figure in you know the rest of the dc universe films um but you know as long as they stick to the character you know they'll find whatever the next wave of creators have to say with him i would also say like in terms of production if you look at the snyderverse the three movies representing that it's kind of, I mean, in one hand, it's a very unique and interesting vision, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. It gets a little too dark for me. He's a little too angsty for me. But I still liked Henry as Superman. I like what Zach was trying to do with that story. However, it's gone so gritty and so dark now in recent productions that I, I, without knowing anything about this new movie, really, beyond what everybody else knows, it feels like it's going to be a back-to-basics approach that it's going to sort of move Superman back, not quite down to Christopher, the level, not down, but back to the level of Christopher Reeves version, but somewhere in between where I think it's going to have a lightness, uh, a optimistic view. And, you know, he will represent the optimism. I keep repeating myself, but in whatever he's facing in that movie. And if the movie works and obviously if it doesn't work, then who knows? But if it does work, I, I really think that's going to sort of be the next wave of the production. Mm. Uh, you know, Superman and Lois has done a very good job of capturing, I think, the optimism of Superman as a character and what he represents. The show itself can be dark and that sort of thing, but I like their approach to him mm -hmm. and, and how they're handling it. And I think if David Corn Sweat works as Superman and, the, and James Gunn's version of it does, I think that's sort of going to represent where we go with it. And I do think it'll be a bit of a throwback. Yeah, I think yeah, it'll I definitely be a throwback. It definitely sounds like it's not going all the way back to the very, very beginnings because we already have all these other superheroes around. It sounds like it might be early in his career and he's not the only super powered person on the planet. So that's going to be, you know, a fresh take on it. Yeah, yeah I'd be, I'd be happy if it sits somewhere in between Superman and Lois and my adventures with Superman uh, in its, you know, the way it feels because my adventures with Superman is obviously, you know, um, a great take. I love it. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, but obviously for a younger audience and I, I want superman to be available to all ages uh you know man mm -hmm. of steel and zack snyder's films are definitely more for a more mature audience and you wouldn't go necessarily taking an eight-year-old to go see those films but i'm hoping james gunn's film sits somewhere where mums and dads will love it and boys and girls that they take along will also love it and it will have something for everyone um i think superman needs to be accessible to you know whether you're five or 85 so that's what my hope is um i'm a graphic designer by profession and I, this book is not just about the material that's in it but it's also about the design and the layout and and you know the way that it's put together can you talk to me about how that came about who i mean you're both writers but um the design of the of the book and the the print production and he talked to me about how that that process 
I mean, that's all insight. I mean, there's yeah. a, an amazing designer uh, who took the tons of words and tons of pictures and somehow made it into this 400 plus page uh, extravaganza. Insight um, picked which items to turn into facsimiles that were going to be uh, bound into the book, what was going to get a fold out. Um, you know, the last pages of the book is this amazing timeline that folds out because the, there's no way you could just do it in two pages. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's all at their end. And we got to see it to help caption it and, uh, you know, give some feedback. But I don't, Ed, I don't, I had nothing to do with it. Did you? No, I think my biggest contribution to the design of the book was, oh, that looks cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, the one time I, re I recommended a cover, they didn't use it, so I stopped. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Now, was there anything left out that you really felt like you wanted to put in there that you wish had been included in the book, but you had to leave out either for space, for, for whatever reason, uh, Ed? I think it's more depth on things. I mean, it sounds crazy to say that because the book has got such, such depth to it. But I find that in a lot of projects, when you're writing and you're passionate about something, and I was very passionate about this subject, you're writing and writing. It's like, well, we're running out of time. No, there's so much more to add to this. I mean, and and I had that on the other book too as well. I was up to 330,000 words and the publisher was like, we need the book. I'm like, but there's so much more to still put in it. Uh, and I think it was like that with this book too. It's just, that's the biggest problem. It's just, you run out of time because, you know, you can't write until you drop dead. So you have to <laughs> have point. And uh, that was sort of the biggest issue. But no, I mean, there's always more you can add, but I was very pleased with the way this thing came together and how it ended up. Yeah, I, I you know, I'm thinking to myself, it's like, we might have been able to do something about how Superman has been depicted uh, around the world in the international editions mm -hmm. of some of the covers from around the world um, in different languages might have been interesting. Um, but other than that, this is this is pretty much what you need. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's all in the title there. It's the definitive history and having read through the book, uh, th getting an early uh, digital version of it, it is, it's phenomenal. I mean, you think that there, oh, there can't be any more written about Superman. Surely this has got to be, you know, there, there isn't too much more. But it's not just the content of the book, but as I said, it's the design, it's the layout, it's the imagery, it's what's included. Uh, that for me really, you know, it's a bold statement to call it the definitive history, but it really is. Um, and it just goes through the whole scope of everything. But it's the inserts and the, 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 the imagery, the, the scans, the, you know, the, the letters the scripts, all those kinds of things that as fans you don't necessarily get to see. Uh, and, in, and in other books, which are mostly text-based, you, you don't really get to see these things. But so the layout and of this book is really for me what, um, you know, Superman's always been a visual uh, element to his, to his, you know, whether it, even if it's on the radio series, you're still imagining the visual elements of what the, the character is doing. Um, so for me, that's what I really love about the Superman, the definitive history. So my hat goes off to both of you and the people uh, who have published this book um, and the designers and uh, the publishers. Uh, it is a phenomenal book. Um, just as a last note, I'll start with you, Ed. Anything you want to tell fans about the book or anything that you feel is a important message that you want fans to know about? Well, look, I've, like I've said, I've spent many years uh, covering different things and all, and I've written probably 20 books in total over my career. But I have to tell you, telling, it was an honor. And it sounds so, again, I always use the word corny because it sounds corny to say that. But it was really an honor to, me to have this book be what it is on this subject. It means so much to me. And it really does feel like the culmination of all these years for me of, of being that little kid who discovered the reruns of, of George Reeves at like 1965. And to be here now with Bob co-writing what is the definitive history of Superman, I wish I could convey how meaningful that is to me personally, having that opportunity. So. Awesome. You know, you always remember your first. And as I said before, you know, Superman was the first comic book I was exposed to. 
And it set me on a course and I owe that character in those comics so much because it shaped the adult I became, it, it shaped the professional writer and editor that I've become and teacher um, that, yeah, I mean, this is giving back and this is saying thank you. And this is honoring that legacy and, you know, having a, what, you know, contributing to this, one volume that can serve as the template for whatever comes next then or whoever writes about it next. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you for taking the time to chat with the Superman homepage tonight. Superman, the definitive history. It's uh, released. I think it's a December 4th. Uh, December 10th. That's the first day. Yep. Okay. So early, de early December, uh, it's available for pre-order. Now the links are up on our website and will be uh, below this video. Uh, that you're watching right now. So make sure you check out Superman, The Definitive History by Edward Gross and Robert Greenberger. It is a phenomenal book. I cannot recommend it enough. And I want to thank you once again for joining us here on Superman Homepage. Uh, Bob and Ed, thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. It was great. This was fun. Thanks for asking us. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you very much.